Hi, I'm Tina Cahill, and welcome to Wisdom and Beyond. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Today we have two great friends here. We have Dr. Ferris Olin from Rutgers University, right? Correct. And we have Dr. Judith Broski, who not only is Dr. Judith Broski, she's really Dr. Dr. Judith Broski, <laughs> because she has two honorary doctorates, right, as well as her MFA. So, and you were, you two are co-founding directors of the Institute for Women in Art at Rutgers, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And you're a professor emerita, and you are about ready to retire, too. Is that not right? That's true, Judy. Well, I don't believe it. You will never <laughs> retire. I know you guys. So here's the deal. Judy and Ferris have this great idea. This wonderful program is going to happen all throughout central New Jersey starting Mo September 9th. Well, actually, our it started already, right? right? Well, anyway, it's called the Fertile Crescent. Here's the deal. It's called the Fertile Crescent. They're going to profile the work of women artists, women from the Middle East, and tell us all about it. Okay, well, this is a project that is five years in the making. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, That's worse than having a child. A very well, long actually, gestation period. No, they usually period. last longer than five years. I'm, I was just thinking of the birthing process. Yes. We want them to last longer than five years. <laughs> well, <laughs> what, what happened was I went to Istanbul in 2007 to the Istanbul Biennial, which was an opportunity to visit artists from around the world, look at their um, exhibitions and artwork. And I was just blown away by the quality of the art that I had seen there. I came back and Judy and I were talking and I said, we must do a show of women artists from the Middle East because so many people here in the United States read about the Middle East, but they think of it in terms of current events um, right. and conflict, all of which is true. Geopolitics is an issue, but, but looking at it through the eyes of cultural production is a whole other story. And so, Judy? And also, at that point, um, one of our curatorial friends had tried to put together a show of Middle East artists, and it had a lot of trouble doing it. And so we thought, well, if we look at Middle East culture, Middle East life through the uh, lens of gender and right. women artists, right. that's a way of doing something that's positive about the Middle East um, and to counteract the suspicion that uh, people in the United States have towards the Middle East since 9-11 um, and bring about a little bit more nuancing, a little bit more understanding of Middle East culture. One of the things um, that was very interesting to us, we've learned a lot mm -hmm. through this, is that the artists themselves um, think, they want us to think in terms of individual countries and individual cultures. Not as a group. Not I as a unified subject, as, sure, as it's called, right. you know, where everybody is assumed to have the mm -hmm. same mm -hmm. background, the same um, history, the same cultural mm -hmm. um, artifacts, and so, uh, or the same language, or the same religion. So we've been very aware mm -hmm. of that as we've gone along and as we've selected our artists. So um, we have an interesting title, and I'm going to let Ferris tell a little bit about how we came to this title. Well, it was, it was very interesting. We were thinking about how to co make a cohesive statement, mm -hmm. and, and I should say that we chose the title Fertile Crescent, mm -hmm. colon, Gender, Art, and Society, because both of us remembered our education in elementary school during geography right. and social studies That's classes. Right where we were taught about the Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. the Euphrates, mm -hmm. and the Tigris, and that this was called the Fertile Crescent. Mm -hmm. And we thought of it in terms of what we had learned, also about the gender implications. Mm -hmm. And now in the 21st century, as um, people have developed new scholarship, there is also the question about colonialism and post-colonialism. So we're using it in an ironic fashion. I also want to say that we are doing this through the Institute for Women in Art at Rutgers, which is the only institute of its kind in the United States focused on women artists and their aesthetic and intellectual impact um, on the cultural landscape. And I would like to talk about that for a minute because that's the part that when you first told me about this project, the Fertile Crescent, that struck me. You know, we think we're sophisticated, but we can still be pretty provincial, right? So you mentioned Istanbul. I, was, I did a keynote at the Istanbul Convention Center years ago mm -hmm. for a convention. And I wanted to go see uh, what we call belly dancing, but what, what you know, they call women's empowerment dancing. They have a lot of it in that area, and there's a very famous club there mm -hmm. where they do it. So I went. And it was, I was the only American. There were lots of women from various countries in the Middle East. 
Some of them had on traditional clothing. Some of them had on burqas and robes and all. Others didn't. It just depended on the situation, right? But they were all hooting and howling and having great time. I had the best, one of the best nights of my life because it was a dance of women. These were dances of women yeah. empowerment. We've kind of sexualized it when it that, comes that, here, right? That's absolutely correct. Absolutely. And we have two artists mm -hmm. in the show um, who work with belly dancing. Isn't it great? In their work. One of them is a Turkish artist who's lived in Paris. Um, she goes back and forth to Turkey. She was educated in Turkey. She ended up in Paris in the 1960s and was involved with um, the student movements and, mm -hmm. and early feminist movement in Paris. And we have um, one of her first pieces, of one of her first feminist pieces, which shows uh, a belly dancer, mm -hmm. um, but just the belly, mm -hmm. no head. It's called mm -hmm. the headless, great, the headless it's woman great. or the belly dancer. Yeah. And on the belly is inscribed the words of a feminist manifesto for women's sexuality, mm -hmm. that women should have the rights to enjoy um, sexual pleasure mm -hmm. uh, just as much as men do. Mm -hmm. um, and as she gyrates, these words become more visible. Oh, how great. The other piece is by a, uh, also by a Turkish artist um, named Nezeket Ikichi, mm -hmm. and uh, she has a belly dancer with big knives attached um, to her hips. And as she gyrates and dances, these knives cut through paper panels that are on all sides of her. So it's a commentary on right. feminism, but a commentary on social right. issues exactly. and constriction and how feminism, right. women can break right. through that. Right. So um, you're mentioning you know, the importance of right. belly dancing, you know, really right. significant in this exhibition. That's and great. Nezuka Dekichi, that work is going to be at the um, Arts Council of Princeton Galleries. Oh, but she is great. also going to do an amazing performance. And again, I will oh, let Ferris fun. describe yes, the uh, performance. On October 4th, oh, at great. the opening of the Arts Council's show, we have organized an art walk. So people can go from the Arts Council to the Princeton University Art Museum and to the Bernstein Gallery at the Woodrow Wilson School, all of which is where you will locate some of the works on display from shows we have curated. You will end up at the Lewis Center, and Nesiket is preparing from 2 o'clock until 8 that day, which is Thursday, October 4th, uh, for a performance that will begin at 8 o'clock, a program that's called Lifting a Secret. Well, what is the secret? This is the story of how she was informed that she was in an arranged marriage. Oh. And so she has prepared a room, um, and she, I can't give away the secret, right. um, but let me just say that there, there is coffee involved, and there are her teenage diaries involved. Oh my goodness. So I, I would encourage everyone to come on October 4th to the Lewis Center to see the show, but also to take the tours beforehand. So this is so exciting. So the, the things that come to me are, looking not only at women in the Middle East, like you're talking about the socio-culture and gender issues, but looking at art in mm -hmm. the various individual countries within the Middle East as not seeing it as a monolith, the way you suggested. And then the other thing that comes to me, it's just women in art all by itself, because, mm -hmm. call me crazy, um, I don't think art has ever really given women a fair shake. I would yeah. be mm -hmm. sure that you guys would agree with me, um, because it's a patriarchal thing, the world's patriarchal, this is just life, and people like you break through it. That's, it, that's exactly, exactly right. right. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. And that's why we established the Institute for Women yes. in Art. Mm -hmm. um, Rutgers um, is actually one of the leading institutions in terms of women's studies. Um, mm -hmm. There are over 300 faculty members at Rutgers, men as well as women, who declare that uh, their research has to do with gender in some way, shape, or fashion, and is at large or I should say, it may not be a large faculty in women's and gender studies, but there certainly is a large body of students that are taking courses. And there are not only a bachelor's degree in women's and gender studies, but also a master's degree and a PhD. Furthermore, there have been a number of artists and art historians, Ferris and me included, who have been at Rutgers, who have been active, who actually were involved in creating the women's art movement in the United States in the 1970s. And so we built on that history. Um, and 
the thing is that people, whilst there have been some changes in terms of recognition of women's work um, in cultural areas, it still is, there's still a long way to go. Right. And we started out with um, job um, equality, mm -hmm. and women were basically um, earning advanced degrees, this goes back to the mm -hmm. 1970s now, right. in mm -hmm. art history and in studio art, and the number of women on faculties was minuscule. Absolutely. It was almost non-existent. Just like in medicine, and as we have broken through, right. the well, masses we break through, but getting into the positions in academia to teach and really sort of own the power right. takes much longer. That's correct. No question. And there's, so there are big changes there, uh, and certainly women are being shown much more in the major art galleries. Uh, at the major museums, where there's still um, a really um, quite um, um, strong discrimination is in the market area, particularly in, in, in terms of investment. Yes. In terms of purchase. In terms of um, who will the buy? Way in which will you buy the art of a man, or will you buy the art of a woman? Yeah. And the Economist a, a couple of months ago did a big piece on this. Mm -hmm. Actually, now what's been interesting to us is to talk to some of our artists from the Middle East yes. and um, achieving in the visual arts in the Middle East is a way in which women are recognized as being more equal with men. Interesting. And so their prices in the Middle East for art by women is better when Middle East collectors are buying it than would be the case in the West. Isn't that so interesting? So there were you know, all kinds of fascinating little bits right. and pieces of life in the Middle East that we learned about um, as we went along um, that was quite different the from, from what we The nuances that we couldn't saw. possibly know because we don't live there and you have to sort of be in the culture yeah. to really get that. Right, exactly. All right, so, so you guys are up and running right now as we speak. We're speaking near the mid, almost the end of August, mm -hmm. near the end of August. And you're up and running, and the and this this program, the Fertile Crescent, is going to extend th from Princeton up through Rutgers, and wh wh how? Where else is this? It, it's all over. I, I know you've told me this, but right. give me a better sense of that. Okay. Well, it, it is uh, there is a core exhibition which Judy and I have uh, curated, which will take place in a number of locations in Princeton and in New Brunswick throughout the fall. And that being the Arts Council of Princeton, the Princeton University Art Museum the uh, Bernstein Gallery as well at the Woodrow Wilson right. School, the Mason Gross School of the Arts Galleries in New Brunswick at Rutgers, mm -hmm. and the Women Artist Series Galleries also at Rutgers. In addition, there are about another eight exhibits which have been created in conjunction with the Fertile Crescent. The West Windsor Arts Council, our local arts mm -hmm. council here as well, will be uh, mounting a show that opens on September 8th. Uh, we'll have shows also at the College of New Jersey, Rutgers in Newark, and Rutgers in Camden. Also the Public Library, Princeton Public Library, the New Brunswick Public Library, the East Brunswick Public Library as well. Um, so we've involved the Arts Councils and the Public Libraries as well as academic institutions and the Institute for Advanced Study. I should say that in addition to the visual arts, we will have about 45 programs happening through until January 13th of 2013, which include works, um, programs, and events about women in literature, women writers, women performers. We'll have film screenings, uh, screen films by women producers and actors. We're going to have um, a wonderful musical event on November 1st at the Institute for Advanced Study that focuses on songs from the Fertile Crescent. Oh, and wonderful. we will be premiering the world premiere of an opera um, sung, the aria is being sung by an Iranian soprano. Um, the libretto is by a Palestinian American playwright. Composer is Andrea Pinto Carrera, a Portuguese writer, uh, composer, and scholar of the Maghreb and its music. And there will also be a Turkish music ensemble performing at the same time. Yeah, and wow. that gives you a sense it's of It's amazing. The fact that, the, that we have a number of partners. We actually think that this mm -hmm. is the first time that there's been this extensive collaboration among so many major academic institutions mm -hmm. 
I don't think that Rutgers, Princeton University, and the Institute for Advanced Study have ever collaborated on this scale before. And then with the community involvement, right. uh, several arts councils, several public libraries. So it's a crossover. It's an elimination of borders between the academic mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. uh, and among yes. the academic institutions yes, and, the, and the public and the institutions public. How great. that, that what serve an educational, the community. What an educational program this is. Well, it is indeed because we're also reaching down to the high school level. I'm yes. um, at New Brunswick Public Library. They're going to organize a filmmaking opportunity for the students in the, in the New Brunswick area uh, who will happen to see some films um, about women in the Middle East and then create their own uh, films. We're also providing an opportunity for high school teachers to do some continuing education credits at Rutgers uh, through a day-long program on how to incorporate gender and art um, in, in society in, of the Middle East into their courses. How great. How fast. How did you guys get, the, how did this develop? Well, I, sh I should go back and say that um, the Institute for Women in Art, um, our, our mission is not just to confine ourselves to artists who live in the United States. Mm -hmm. And prior to this particular project, mm -hmm. um, we did a project with um, artists from Southeast Asia. Um, we did two exhibitions, one of which was consisted of artists who actually live in India and Pakistan. And then we did um, a second exhibition, which were artists from India and Pakistan who live uh, in the United States. So we had both the artists who are part of their country and the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the interesting that's things about the Fertile Crescent also, is that our artists also mm -hmm live in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, and the artists themselves uh, don't want to be considered even transnational or binational. Um, one of the terms that we've mm -hmm. come to use is, um, the, uh, there are actually a couple of terms. Um, uh, one is inaccessible um, uh, um, connections, inter in, um, inter in intersections, intersections, Unavail unavailable. unavailable intersections, mm -hmm. um, meaning that you can't put together the nationalities and the religions and 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 daily life. Um, and then uh, Kelly Baum, who's the curator, the Haskell curator of modern and contemporary at Princeton Art Museum. She uh, has come up with the term precarity, that these artists live in a situation of precarity, that they don't, they don't really have a, a national identity any longer um, as such, or they don't like to think of themselves as having national identities, that they too have dissolved borders. Um, one of the artists is an artist named Mona Hatoum, and another one of the essayists in our catalog um, uh, has done a long piece about Mona Hatoum's um, map, which is a handmade paper piece that's in the Princeton University Art Museum that is all white. There's not the usual colors, you know, that it's yellow. It's like Klein blue. Yeah, you know that yes, in Paris. That's yes. my favorite piece of art. You need really, to know that. <laughs> oh, oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. And her point is that this is kind of a utopian vision on Mona Hatoum's part mm -hmm. of seeing a world that doesn't have borders in it. Well, them. isn't that what art is about? Well, that's what we I found, mean, right. I, yes. I, and we feel that people can come together through this. For mm -hmm. instance, we have um, artists whose countries are at war with each other, but their work as artists are side by side. And mm -hmm. I would say that a lot of the work addresses um, some of the conflict uh, in the Middle East, but addresses it through the, gen through the lens of gender, um, addresses it mm -hmm. from a point of view of looking at issues that are issues that can be resolved. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we feel that we're um, bringing together people in a way that is positive, that does away with some of that negative feeling that um, we've had in the West about the, the Middle East. Right. And I mean, I think the whole function of art and anything creative is to break down these borders so that we can have a larger understanding. For example, there I was in Istanbul for a week pretty much by myself when I was done working and what drew me was the creativity, the dance, the art, because that's more about feeling f and, and it's a way to connect that sort of jumps over geopolitical issues or, mm -hmm. you know, things that's like that. And I know my daughter, who's an attorney, 
uh, actually has a PhD in law and society, and she wrote a book years ago, uh, The Development of Sexual Harassment Law in Multinational Companies, and really found that a lot of those, that law came from the American law, but then it got changed to fit the countries. But that kind of stuff doesn't just automatically draw you, you know, it doesn't have that emotional content to it. So to study something that comes from a region like mm -hmm. the Middle East, mm -hmm. I think art is the logical thing to sort of break down those barriers. Well, I think it's interesting. As well as gender barriers. Right. I think it's interesting as well because for two po reasons. One is that in addition to artists from the Middle East, we know that uh, the spread of Islam into Africa and Southeast Asia. So we have artists representing those continents as well. But also, we're very fortunate that one of the other essayists in our book um, for, the for the catalog of the Fertile Crescent is Margot Badran, who's been living in Cairo uh, this past year. And so we commissioned her to write an essay working with contemporary Egyptian women artists about what's happening since Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it's been very, very interesting to see the work and to hear her talk about what's going on there and to listen to the artists respond to the revolution. They were part of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Now they are no right. longer part of the right. revolution. This is current events, right. current events with an artistic bent. Unfortunately, we aren't able to bring that art to uh, the actual walls um, here in central New Jersey, but we have mounted pictures of them on our website for a virtual exhibit. That's www.fertile-crescent.org. Okay, so it's www.fertile-crescent.org. And people right? should not forget the dash. <laughs> yes, I was thinking that. Why do you have the dash? Um, it's, that, that's a matter that's of... That's just how they did it. It's you domain. Have to, domain, to domain, domain. There was already right. somebody already crescent, had a right. domain right. that was yeah. Fertile Crescent right. without yeah. a dash. Yeah. So by putting so a no dash choice. in, we were right. able to do it. Yeah. I was going to mention that um, I think, uh, good to go back to, to, to your point um, about... Um, uh, you know, borders and, and geopolitical conflict and how art, um, you know, can deal with some of this. Right. Um, one of the artists uh, who is at the Bernstein Gallery is an artist named Zaina Barake, who now lives in San Francisco, but she is Palestinian, Lebanese, and one of the pieces that she has in the Bernstein Gallery is um, a, a wall piece that's, you know, quite large um, that consists of uh, uh, enlargements of uh, the, her family's passports over the century. Very because interesting. they go back to the end of, of World War I when right. the, the Ottoman Empire right. was broken up right. and there were different mandates that European right. countries held. And so the earliest passports in her family, in this little family mm -hmm. history, are British mandate mm -hmm. passports from 1917, I think. Mm -hmm. And then the various countries that her family has had to live in as a result of the geopolitical conflicts mm -hmm. that have been going on in the Middle East. So right there you have you know, a personal way of recounting what has been happening politically and historically. And so it's much more absorbable, as you were pointing out mm -hmm. before, rather than just reading a dry history it's of true. The, mm -hmm. these it's true. changes. You, you, it's absorbable is the right word. You feel it, you hear it, you see it, and it just goes into that little brain in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. And so as you guys were talking about this, um, I've known both of you for a few years here. What uh, drew you to art, to work in the field of art? Um, well, I'll start and then Ferris can, can pick up. Um, I, my parents tell me that I picked up a pencil before I could walk or talk and that I never put it down. They couldn't get it away from me. So um, I've just, uh, I've been an artist, uh, or my identity is as an artist. If you were to ask me to mm -hmm. talk about my identity, the first thing I would say is I'm an artist. Before I would say I'm a woman, before I would say I'm a really? United States citizen, You're I would say I'm an artist. Yeah. So that everything I do kind of stems from that. And although I pursue a career as an artist who actually makes things, um, I really feel that there are many ways of having impact on the world um, besides making one's own art. 
So I don't feel that doing these kinds of things in any way betrays my identity as an artist. It just expands it right. and gives me other opportunities to have impact um, through my art. Absolutely. How could you be an artist and not appreciate art? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Other people are. And Paris, you want and to talk And I about am not an artist. I know. Um, but I am very creative. You and are. I, I believe that I'm, I'm also an extremely visual person. Um, as you can tell, I like That's colors. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I look at the world through art and colors. But I'm also very interdisciplinary in my thinking. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of curiosity. And I use art as the way to get at larger issues of society. I think that's great. And, and I'm pleased that, you know, working with Judy, with the Institute, because in addition to developing programs and exhibits, we also are responsible for curriculum development. We have an online class that people can take anywhere in the world on gender, art, and society. And how do they access, how do they find out about that? If they go to our website, the Institute's website, or to Rutgers University. Right. They will find okay. the, how to, to uh, register for the course. We also uh, are responsible for research and documentation with regard to women. One of the reasons uh, women artists have been written out of history is that there have been uh, no documents about them. So we've created an archive where we have the largest resource of works, uh, primary materials, about women artists and women's art organizations in the United States since 1945 and developed other resources as well. We want to counter the erasure of women artists and Absolutely. recognize when well, you say 1945, I mean Yeah, well we go back for you know much further, but these are where the archives are at the moment. That's that's where you've gone to so far. Right. And right. your and your plan is to go further back. Yes, we or so forward. Right. Or, or forward. Or forward. Right. Okay. It's hard oh, so to go back further. I think so. There's no record. Right? There's no record. Yeah. My my favorite story about that um, is um, Angelica Kaufman, a late 18th, early 19th century artist who lived part of the time in Italy and part of the time in London. Um, and Angelica Kaufman, in her own time, was so famous that when she died, she was living in Rome when she died, um, she's the only other artist besides Raphael, everyone knows Raphael's mm -hmm. name, the only other artist whose funeral procession went th through the streets of Rome. And today, unless you're talking to art historians right. and artists, people in, right. and, uh, and, and uh, people who are interested in right. the history of women right. artists, People don't know who Angelica amazing, Kaufman isn't it? was. So it's that kind of thing right. that we're trying to do away That's great. with. Because we've tried to do that in other fields to some right. extent as it relates to women. But I mean, there's so many f areas where we could do that. But I think it's just wonderful that you're going back and trying to sh share with the world the history of women in the arts that have, were so important for their time but yet lost to history. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, wh how sad is that, right? And it only empowers women in art today. I right. mean, to have a history behind you, to have, mm -hmm. you know, these great women behind you has to be an empowering feeling. And exactly. You stand and on their shoulders. Yeah, and, uh, and, and it goes beyond um, making art or mm -hmm. doing history right. of art. For instance, a young woman who has been involved with us named Jillian Hernandez mm -hmm. has used women artists as models for young women, young teenagers I at risk. Um, and by having them study great. about some of the women artists who were active uh, in the last few decades, um, it's a way of having these young women um, reach a higher level of self-esteem and understand that they can achieve things in it's the great. world. It's great. It's great. We can't have enough of that for young women, right? No, absolutely. So I want to get this straight because I want everybody to become part of this exhibit. And I really say become part of it because it's so spread out within the community that I don't think that we go see the Fertile Crescent. I think we go stand amid the Fertile Crescent, mm -hmm. right, and sort of soak yes. it up. I think that's a better way to describe it. So starting when, take me through it again, the Arts Council of Prin Princeton. Right, the Arts Council of Princeton show opens um, October 4th. The other shows right now at Mason Grove School of the Arts at the Princeton University Art Museum at the Bernstein Gallery. Which is at Woodrow Wilson. At the Woodrow Wilson School and in New Brunswick at Rutgers on the Douglas campus, the Women Artist Series Galleries. All of those shows are open now. The Women Artist Series Gallery show will open next week. And I've seen the catalog, or the book, yes. which is incredibly thick and unbelievably beautiful. 
Where do you find that? Where is that? Well, we feel really fortunate um, because the book has been picked up, acquired by DAP, Distributed Art Publishers. Okay. And they are the biggest distributors of art books and catalogs in the world. Great. And so it's going to be in all the museum bookstores around the world. Oh, great. Right now, people can actually order it on Amazon. I was wondering. <laughs> and, and Barnes and Noble. That's and great. And just all they have to do is type in Fertile Crescent, Gender Art and Society. That's great. And they can place an order. Now, the book has been subsidized. We got a large, we have two major grants, one from the National Endowment for the Arts and one from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. And we have other um, grants as mm -hmm. well, and the mm -hmm. institutions mm -hmm. are supporting this program, of course, to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. But through those two large grants, we've been able to uh, um, publish the catalog at a very reasonable price. Great, because it's beautiful. Only it's $45, under well, that's $50. Great. It's a beautiful piece of art. <laughs> it is. It truly is. It was great. It's well, it's stunning. so great. So here we have Dr. Ferris Olin and Dr. Judith Brodsky from the uh, Institute for Women in Art at Rutgers, the co-founders, and we've been talking about the Fertile Crescent, which I think you get the idea. We need to go stand in, in the midst of this sort of a community art uh, festival, if you might want to call it that, mm -hmm, exhibit, definitely. and learn more about women, art, gender, and the individuals that make art within the various countries that we call the Middle East. Would that be right? Correct. All right. Very nice. And this goes from, give me the, the beginning date and August the August 13th to, sub, uh, to January 13th. So, Ferris, is there a cost involved in, in going to see the, the, all this artwork at the Fertile Crescent at this exhibit? There is not a single cost involved for the general public to come to any of the exhibitions or all of the programs that are being presented in conjunction with the Fertile Crescent project. So there's no fee at all? No. And the website is? www.fertile-crescent.org. Okay, and don't forget the hyphen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Let's have a great time, and we have so much to learn this fall thanks to you, too. So thank you for being with us. Well, thank, thank you. you. Glad to have you. Bye-bye. <laughs>